Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Be an Entrepreneur, Not a Wantrepreneur, Get Your Business Idea Off the Ground. My name is Manel Issa from CCIQ, and I'll be your facilitator today. Joining us is Regan Gooley, Principal at Cullen's Patient and Trademark Attorneys. So just to run through a few tips to get the most out of today's session, we'll be online for about 40 minutes and following the main presentation, there'll be an opportunity for any questions and answers with Regan. So please feel free to send through the questions that you do have to Regan at any stage during today's presentation using the text box on the screen. Um, following the session, we'll also send you an emailed copy of the presentation um, and link you to any additional supporting information that may pop up along the way. So make sure you check your inboxes on that one. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to Regan, who will be presenting, be an entrepreneur, not a wantrepreneur, get your business idea off the ground. Thanks, Manel. Um, welcome everybody. Thanks for attending and coming online. Um, the title's a bit wordy, but we'll we'll get over the title. We'll we'll move straight into it. Um, we are asked as a part of the webinar to establish our credentials. Hopefully, that's what this slide does. It gives you a rather good picture of myself. Um, it also lets you know the types of things that I do. Um, so the bot. It's probably better to start at the bottom than the top. Um, I was at uni for a long time. Um, I have three different degrees. Patent attorneys are not lawyers though. Um, so even though I've got a law degree, I am required to have a technical degree in order to be a patent attorney. So my technical degree is in engineering. Um, I do have the other two, which helps a lot in this type of area, obviously. Um, but the, the take home message, I guess, is uh, that patent attorneys are not lawyers. If you have a legal question, better to ask a lawyer. If you've got an IP question, probably better to ask a patent and trademark attorney because the two fields are slightly different. So I'll leave that with you and we'll, we'll jump straight into it. Um, the idea for this webinar basically came out of a, a sort of a new initiative that Cullen's is, is getting involved in called the Ideas Launchpad. Um, we get asked a lot being involved in intellectual property you know, I've got a new idea, what do I do with it? Or where do I take it from here? Or is it even a good idea? Um, and I guess the take home message from from that those conversations over time is not all ideas are good ideas. Um, some ideas are good, some ideas are not good. Um, some ideas are very good ideas, but they always fail putting them into practice. Um, they're either too expensive or they're too complex or there's no market for them and things like that. Um, so that's where the title comes from, the, the, the being an entrepreneur, not a wantrepreneur. Uh, and as I said at the bottom of this slide, the, the wantrepreneur is someone who wants to be an entrepreneur but never actually quite gets there. So the discussion that we're going to have today is more along that line. So you, you have an idea, how do you actually turn that idea into a viable business or income? Because not everyone is, is having ideas to turn it into a business. Some people invent just to get a business. So they, they either invent in the business that they're in or they invent a new product and then design a business around that new product or service. Um, some people come up with an idea and their sole purpose is to make some income out of it. So you don't have to have a business in order to make the income. There are other options available. Um, and we'll work through, through some of those options as we move through this, uh, this talk. So the talk's broken up into three different parts. The first part is understanding and evaluating your idea. Basically, you know, the first step when people come to us and say, I've got an idea, the question that we ask back is, well, what is the idea? Is it more than just an idea or is it an idea as such? And then how do you work out if the idea is worth proceeding with? Because um, that's the question that we probably see the most Basically, everyone that comes into us is looking for some sort of advice as to whether it's worth it or not, which is a very difficult question to answer, as we'll see. There are some tools that you can use to sort of try and quantify whether it's worth it or not. Um, and we actually have one of those tools and, and the, I think the special offer at the end of the, the webinar is actually in relation to the evaluation tool. So there are some things that you can do and ways that you can go about working out whether it's worth it. Um, but before you can do that, you really need to know what the idea, and I use that in inverted commas, what the idea is. So 
it's best if you always submit your sort of broad idea to some some questions, some preliminary questions. You know, what are you trying to do? Um, how does the thing work? You know, you have to. I treat this as very much a product based based question, but it can be in relation to service. So, how does the service work? What's the you know what's the point of difference? What are you trying to? What problem are you trying to solve by providing the business? You know does it solve a problem or is it just an alternative to something that's already out there you know apple sells millions of iphones a year that the iphone's very similar to other phones you know what problem does the iphone actually solve or does it not solve a problem and people just like it because it's cool um you know that's a viable sort of marketing way of looking at things so it doesn't have to solve a problem necessarily but it's important knowing that it doesn't necessarily solve a problem going in as well um then there's some more sort of patent attorney questions. Um, what what features does it has to have? Uh, does it have to have, and what things are optional? So you know, if it has to have a you know a USB plug in order to power it and get information in and out of it, then it's got to have some sort of plug. It doesn't have to have actually be a USB. Um, it can be a mini USB. It can be you know one of those I think they're called Firewire ports, aren't they? Um, those types of things. So it has to have some, or it might have to have some way of conveying information, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a particular port. Um, what sorts of things can you can you add to it to improve it? Um, even even further than that, is it reliant on other? types of equipment so if you're selling a headset for a computer for example someone needs a computer in order to use the headset so headset sales are really dependent upon computer sales or phone sales so if you're dependent upon another product for your sales then that's important to know as well and um, is it a need or a want so are people going to see it and have to buy it so again you know if someone sees a headset do they are they going to have to buy a computer do they have to have USB flash drives to make the computer work? Do they have to have software to make it work, um, or is it just things that they might want? You know, I don't, I don't need an iPhone seven when my iPhone five works per perfectly fine. I just want an iPhone seven, um, so and I'm prepared to pay for it. So that that's the way you market it. So it's a, a sort of a luxury item um, or a discretionary spend item. Um, why will people pay money for it? And that's an important question. A lot of people that come into us basically come into us with an idea per se, if you like. And the first question that I generally ask is, how are you going to make money out of this thing? You know, is it something that you are going to sell? Is it something that people are willing to pay money for? Because it can be the best idea in the world, but if you don't put it at the right price point or offer it to the right customer, then no one is going to buy it and it's not going to make any money. You might think it is, and this stuff can be very emotional. Um, so when people come in, you know, the, the new invention or the new idea is their baby and they will take no criticism of their baby. Um, that sort of stuff is important to recognise. You don't have to cut that out of the process but you need to be able to recognize when you're emotionally invested in it and when you're not emotionally invested in it and it's best I know this might sound really silly to some people it's best that you are not emotionally involved in the invention um, so if it's a good idea but you can take it or leave it then that's probably the best way to look at it. they're probably the ones that are going to be more successful than not um, is there any way of making it cheaper or simpler then that's an important question as well because if there is a way of making it cheaper or simpler once you release it to the market, the copiers are probably going to try and make it cheaper or simpler. So if you can think of those ways before you actually do anything with it, then you can at least forward plan a little bit to make it make it a little bit easier for you to adapt once that sort of copying occurs. Um, and lastly, do you know of anything similar? So that's important from a competitor point of view as well as from a you know, coming from my background, a purely IP point of view. If you're looking at getting protection on this thing, then knowing what's similar and what's around that is similar is important to the protection. But it's also important from a practical point of view because you will be competing with those similar products. If you have the same product at a higher, a higher price point, you're probably going to sell less than if you have a similar product, a similar quality product at a lower price point. Or if yours has additional functionality that makes a difference, then you might be able to charge a premium and things like that. So. A little bit of clarification around what the idea actually is right at the start and you might not have have the answers to this stuff but it's important that you think about it and answer them where you can because that all helps with the next phase which is working out whether or not it's worth it 
Now, this slide is all about what will not happen. Strangely enough, it is a very idealised view of what everyone thinks is actually going to happen. And this, this stuff does not happen, or if it does, it might happen, you know, one in a million times. You've all heard the story about the overnight success that takes 15 years. It's very similar in most of these new things. You know, this, you won't find someone immediately that's got bucket loads of cash and wants to give it to you, although everyone thinks they do, um, or they're going to find that type of thing. So it's, it's important to realise what will not happen, but deciding whether it's worth it or not, if you take a, a, a non-emotional quantitative view of what makes an idea worth proceeding with, what you're really trying to work out is, do I have enough to actually spend more time and money and effort, because you will, on this idea to take it forward? Or can I basically draw a line through it at a very early stage and say, well, that's just not going to work? So, as I said, there are tools around to help you do this. Um, it is important that you be as objective as possible because if you are emotionally invested in it, you know, when you get asked the question about what the market size is, everyone says, oh, it's a million, it's, a, it's going to sell a million. You know, not everything is going to sell a million. It's just not practical to think that way. You need to be you know, harsher probably than easier when you're coming to that evaluation stage because if an idea is not going to cut it at the start, then it's not going to cut it full stop. You know, you need to be basically in the best form that you can be in to move it forward because if it's not in that form, it probably won't succeed. So a little bit of work at the start gets you a whole lot of, uh, saves you a whole lot more grief down the back. Um, you know, you've heard it again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if you look at it that way, trying to work out you know, whether it is worth it or not, you'll be ahead of the curve. So part two of the sort of the framework, if you like, so part one is what is the idea? Once you know what the idea is, the next part of it is really, you know, how do you develop that idea? Because the idea itself is not going to do anything. You really need to go through these sorts of, these sorts of steps to work out you know, to get it to a viable stage because, again, you know, no one is going to pay money for an idea. They want to buy a product or they want to buy a service and once they buy the product, they want to know that it's supported by after sales service and that there's parts for it and things like that. So you probably should work through some of these. Um, where do you start? So these these questions or this breakup table is really the the background of the evaluator that we have. Um, so it's a it's a, uh, a set of questions that you ask, that you answer. They all have five answers. You get points for each answer. Come to the end of it, you work out, you know, plus or minus whether you've got, you're above an average or below the average. And if you're below the average, then it's probably not worth going ahead. Um, there are certain go, no go questions um, that you should ask yourself. You know, is it legal to do what you want to do? Because if it's not legal, that is a no go area. Um, is it going to adversely affect the environment? that's probably also a no-go question. Um, you know, if the answer is no, or if the answer is yes to, we're going to we're going to adversely affect the environment, then, you know, you probably should be looking at whether it's a viable idea. Um, then there's questions about the idea or the concept, which is some of that stuff that I've already, already been through. Um, you know, if you're looking at getting investors, the first thing an investor will say to you is, what is your unique selling point? So, or your unique value proposition. There's a number of different acronyms for it, but you need to work out at its core, what is it about this idea that makes it different from the things that other people uh, already have on offer? Then there's questions about the market. Um, so, you know, how many customers in the world are there? How many customers in Australia are there? Are you, are you only interested in Australia? Are you interested in a worldwide type of deal? Um, one warning there, everyone looks at the US and says the US is my market. Um, the US market is an extremely difficult market to crack. Um, it is, it's probably one of the most difficult markets to crack because there's so much com competition for that particular market. So the more you can work out about the particular demographic of the person that you are actually going to sell to, the better off you are. So there will be general industry or market questions, but the more you can narrow down to, you know, I am pitching this at a 20 to 30 year old female professional person 
you know, that's a pretty good market segment. You can you can work out whether your product or service is going to be attractive to a 20 to 30 year old female professional because there's going to be market research that is either has been done or can be done on that market segment. But you need to know what that market segment is. And you can't just say, well, I could sell this to anybody. If you try to sell to everybody, then nine times out of ten you end up selling to nobody because you don't appeal to anybody particularly. So a little bit of clarification about the market as well. Um, there's also questions about your skills. So that's not to be demeaning to anybody, but I have a particular set of skills. My skills are all about how to help people get intellectual property protection. You know don't come to me for legal advice because I don't know anything about it. And I'm comfortable saying I don't know anything about it. I have a management responsibility in my firm, but am I the ideal manager? No, probably not. Am I going to field accounting questions? No way. I've got, a, I've got an accounting team for that. So there are core skills that you will need to have if you are going to go into business yourself. Even if you are going to license the invent or the, the idea to someone else to make and use, you're still going to need to look at whether you have negotiation skills in order to negotiate that license and then the legal skills to actually draft the license agreement. You probably won't. So if you don't have particular skills, then you're going to need to fill those skill blanks in using professional advisors and it's much easier if you know what skills you have and which ones you need at the start. Then there's some more generic questions about your plan. You know, one of the one of the portions coming up is is business planning. Um, there's a lot of different views on business planning. Ultimately, you will need a business plan. Um, so it's best to start thinking about this in terms of business planning at the start, um, just to have an idea about what sorts of things you need to consider for a business plan because as I said, regardless of whether people think business plans are essential or non-essential, anyone who's willing to invest money or looking to invest money into an idea is going to want some form of business plan. How do you find the answers to all those questions? There you go, research, research and more research. You can research all of those things. So there are professional firms around that do research. There will be research that is publicly available. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics will have, it's actually quite surprising how much information they have publicly available that you can get to. Um, there are, as I said, private firms around that can do particular market research. If you know the demographic or the market segment that you want to be targeting, you can actually do market research on that particular market segment. You can investigate your competitors. There's a variety of different ways to do that as well. Industry groups are particularly good for looking at competitors. Industry groups are also good for looking at the industry, so general trends on whether the, the market might be growing or shrinking or directions in market and things like that. Um, I gave you the quote from Donald's, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, it seems when you read it, it's really confusing, but he actually had a point. It's the things that you don't know you don't know that you pay for. So what you're trying to do out of the research is you're trying to identify as much information as you possibly can that you can rely on, but you're also trying to work out what you don't know. And if you can do that, then again, you're going to be ahead of the curve. So the more research you do at the earliest possible stage, generally the more likely you will be to go well. One of the steps in here is get serious about prototyping. If you've got a product, even if you've got a service, there are particular ways to offer a service or package a service. Um, and a lot of people don't think about services in that way. The trouble with services is they're, they're normally intangible. You know, you, you look at it and you go, what am I actually getting out of this? People come to us all the time and say, at the end, what do I get? And the, the simple answer that I, I give them is you get a certificate. Well, it's not even really a certificate. It's an electronic file of a certificate that you can then print out. So you can spend thousands of dollars on a patent and not actually get anything tangible out of it. So packaging for services is, is as important as it is for prototyping for products. Um, but if I steer myself into, into products a little bit, there is nothing that sells a product more than having people play with that product. So that first point with the experiential marketing, that's an actual, go and Google it and have, have a read of some of, the, some of the documents that come up. Basically, there's been all sorts of work done around 
how the ability to touch something changes the way that users think about it. So once people can actually have something to touch and play with, they're a lot more emotionally invested in it and they're much more likely to purchase it. I went to a talk two weeks ago about the different purchasing habits between men and women. Women are much more likely to buy something if they can touch it. A man will go into a shop and say, I need a can of paint. It needs to be this color, it needs to be four liters, it needs to be satin or gloss. I don't care what brand it is, just give me the paint. A woman will walk in and say, I have to paint a wall. I'd like it to be teal. Do you have anything like that? And she'll want to engage with the salesperson. Now the salesperson and the, the moral of the story is the salesperson doesn't, doesn't necessarily want to solve the problem too quickly because that way the, the women can sometimes lose the, the positive customer experience. What the, woman, what the women generally want to do is they want to be listened to. So the ability to touch something, the ability to engage with your customers is very important. It's much easier to do that with a prototype than it is than with a picture on a page. As the quote says on the right hand side, if a picture's worth a thousand words, a prototype's worth a thousand pictures because you can touch it, you can play with it. You might even break it, but if you break it, then that's a good thing as well. At least you know what to fix. Um, you do want to think about financial planning and what a prototype does is it allows you to start doing some of that financial planning. So once you've got a prototype, you can work out how much it's actually going to cost to manufacture. You can work out based on that what your potential sales price is when you compare it with what the market's prepared to pay. Then you can work out where your profit is. If you're making no profit, then you're pretty sure that it's not going to work. So. Once you've got your prototype though, you can make you can start making some of those judgments. Before you've got a prototype, you're really doing it all at sort of arm's length and you're very much in the dark. So prototyping helps with that sort of stuff as well. If I can give you a tip about prototyping, find an industrial designer, find a good one. Um, there are good ones around. There are also, as with anything, there are not so good ones around. Um, seek input as to who your industrial designer should be what what types of things they should offer, what types of things they should do when they're talking about actually designing the product for you. Um, what you want to end up with is, as I said there, a highly resolved product. And that's what that was is what working with an industrial designer can actually get you. You can get a product that can be tested and can be evaluated and is highly resolved very early on in the picture by spending a bit of money and it's not cheap but it's not expensive so this allows you to get to that prototype which opens up a whole lot of other things that are important to the success or failure of what's going to be the idea or business that the the uh, idea implements so i talked about business planning before as i said you will need one not everyone agrees about it but you will need one so you know one of the things that I, I often say in relation to business planning is if you Google business planning and look at who offers um, the top 10 hits on Google, if you like, about business planning, you'll find that the majority of them are banks. They offer free information about business planning or the government or one or more governments. And the reason that the top 10 hits in Google about business planning are from governments or the banks is they're the people who are generally giving money out based on business plans and they will not give you money unless you have one. So that should give you a good tip about whether you need one or, or why you need one. Business plans, as I said, give you direction. They help with seeking finance from banks and governments and things. Um, so you go to the government for a grant, they will require a business plan. And there are a lot of available resources in relation to business planning. So business.gov.au is a very good one. Um, they actually have a, a business plan template and explanatory document that you can download for free. So really good stuff. It is available. It's just a matter of knowing that it's actually there. So you, know, you will require a business plan. All the stuff that we've spoken, to, spoken about up until now will end up in your business plan or at least be a part of your business plan. So it is important that you think about business planning because those who fail to plan, plan to fail. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, I gave you the quote there too. I, I particularly like that one. So that's a, I used that one the other day in an in-house meeting. So um, you will need one, get one. All the stuff that we've spoken about up until now will actually help you get one and design one. So part three, uh, implementing your plan. The best laid plans of mice and men, rah, rah, rah. You have to actually implement it. That involves actually doing something. So 
the worst stories that I hear are people come in and say, oh, I've got a new idea. Oh, by the way, I invented post-its. And you go, yeah, that's great. What did you do about it? Nothing. Well, there you go. You didn't really invent post-its, did you? Um, you know, I invented the, the thing on the end of my shoelaces that, that keeps my shoelaces together, which, by the way, is called an aglet, just in case there's a trivial pursuit question for you. Um, you know, if you don't do anything about it, then it's worth nothing. And I can tell you whether you'll, you'll succeed or fail based on whether you're, plan whether you're ready to do anything about it or not. If you're not pre plan pre prepared to do anything about it, then ultimately you're not going anywhere. You will be a entrepreneur. You'll come up with all these ideas and not actually do anything. So as I said, I'll, I'm a, a big fan of quotes. Um, starting is actually probably the most difficult part. Once you start, you find that things can snowball. They can snowball far too quickly, but they do actually snowball. You can actually gain momentum once you actually start. So start small, you know, start whenever, but actually start. Um, and as, as Bruce said, short-term intensity is good, but long-term consistency ultimately wins. So even if you don't work at it, at a high intensity at the start, just starting and, and chipping away at it will actually get you closer to your goal than launching into it, you know, at a huge rate of knots over a weekend and then not doing anything about it the next weekend. It's like going to the gym. Fat people don't lose weight because they don't exercise. They either just don't exercise enough or they don't eat the right foods. It's, it's relatively sim simple. It's a mass balance. I'm an engineer. It's a mass balance. Put less in, you'll you'll generally be better than you are if you put more in. So consistency is important. So be consistent. It's not going to come overnight, but it won't happen at all if you're not consistent. All right. What happens when things don't go your way? As I said, love quotes, love quotes. My particular favorite on this one is the pink one. Um, Every flower must grow through dirt. There will be a lot of people that will say that idea is stupid. There'll be a lot of people who say that idea is not going anywhere. There'll be a lot of people who say no. There'll be far more people say no than there will be who say yes. So things won't go all your way all of the time, but you can't quit. If you quit, all of the time and effort that you've invested up until that time is a waste. So you need to be committed, which is a feedback loop because if you evaluate this thing at the start and decide that it is worth the commitment, then that's fine. If you don't evaluate it at the start and you get halfway through it, you really aren't committed to it. So it's very easy to give up on something that you're not committed to. So if you evaluate it correctly at the start, you build the right sort of processes in. By the time things start to not go your way, you'll generally be fairly robust about how to overcome those things because you know the old adage, quitting is not an option. You know. If you want to get somewhere, you want to get there. The overnight success that takes 15 years, that happens all the time. You know, no one, no one is good the first time around. Most of the entrepreneurs, if you buy a, a self-help book written by an entrepreneur, most of them will say, it took me, you know, 20 failures to get one success. And they generally do. But once they've had the one success, they generally turn it into something more. So Edison's famous, famous for saying, it's not actually on this slide, I'll give you this one for free. Um, Thomas Edison, the inventor of the light bulb, he's famous for saying, I didn't find one way to make a light bulb work, I found 99 ways how to make one not work. So, and that's, that's the sort of mindset that people have to have. You, you're going to have your setbacks, you just have to keep pushing forward. Which ties in with this slide, accessing help. So, you will need help. Not everyone has that exhaustive list of skills. Um, not everyone knows everything about everything. Um, there are professional advisors out there. You need to have a core of professional advisors in different areas. So it's very likely that in addition to your industrial designer, you will need a, an accountant. Um, if you're not an accountant yourself. You will need a lawyer if you're not a lawyer yourself. So you basically have to work out who you need, what skill sets you need, and then try and either gain those skill sets yourself, hire people with those skill sets, or if money doesn't permit, then basically outsource to external consultants. People are around. Um, sometimes the best 
the best way to get external consultants is to ask an external consultant that you already have. Most lawyers will know an accountant or two. Most accountants will know a patent attorney or two. Most patent attorneys know industrial designers. So it is a big circle. It all sort of feeds into, um, you know, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So that sort of stuff is important. But when you don't know somebody, ask, you know, if you know somebody has been through the process before, ask them who they went to, how they helped. Um, there's lots of sources online, but as I've said there, be careful what you trust, particularly when it comes online. Um, everyone's probably aware, but you know, anyone can open a website and basically hold themselves out to be a, a trustworthy advisor. Um, so you have to be careful of what you trust on the on the internet and you have to be careful of who you trust as well. Um, you can get non-disclosure agreements, you can do all that sort of stuff you like, but you know, questions to ask when you're looking for a professional advisor are things like, have you done this type of thing before? Who are the clients that you've used before? Um, are there any success stories that you've had? Things like that, it gives you a picture as to what their service or what what the quality of service that they offer actually is. Um, you know, you can go to LinkedIn and places like that to actually find the professionals. Um, and you can generally look at people's contacts. You know, it might be, or recommendations. Lots of LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn pages have recommendations from third parties. Um, some of those are from their friends, I hate to say it, or family. Um, so they may not be particularly, uh, uh, unbiased, but a lot of them are from third parties. So, you know, if you're if you're careful, you'll rarely get bitten. But even those who are careful can get bitten. Again, more research you do, the better it will turn out. But you know, the fallback position is ask people, um, ask your your existing professional advisors, ask your friends and family if they know anybody. Um, you know, those types of contacts can be can be really important. You will build this this sort of set of skills or set of skilled advisors over time. Um, and and it, as I said, it won't come overnight, but spend a bit of time on it. You'll find the ones that you can work with. And it's important that you find the ones that you can work with, because if you want to turn it into a successful business, it, it will be hopefully there for a period for a while. So you'll, you know, long-term relationships are better than the short-term relationships because you, you might be working with these people for, for quite some time. You know, patents last 20 years. So potentially I'm working with a new client for the next 20 years. So they have to be comfortable that the advice that I'm giving them is A, correct, um, and B is advice that fits with their sort of risk profile. Because if either of those is out, then I'm not a, a valued advisor because um, they either won't listen or they won't pay generally. So build up your 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 suite of advisors um, and it may take some time, but soldier on, you'll get there. Okay, the closing thought. A lot of people that come into our office say, you know, this stuff, particularly IP, is only for big companies. You know, it it doesn't really help when you're small and being small is a disadvantage. I, I will give you that. But, you know, you can start small and grow. That's generally the way things happen. Um, I've given you a story about spiders that hopefully is inspiring, not disgusting. Uh, it is vaguely disgusting, I understand that. But you know, the moral of the story is that it doesn't really matter how big you are, it's what you do. So you have to start, you have to plan, you have to implement. If you do all of those things, then big or small, you know, you will get bigger. And if you get bigger, the more play you get, the bigger you are, the more play again that you get. So you have to take these things sensibly. Do what you can from where you are. You know, you you might not have the biggest budget in the world at the start, so you've got to spend your money wisely. So pick the things that you're going to do. And you know, it should be clear by now that the more research you do at the start, the more preparation, if you like, for the implementation, the better it is. So that's the end of me rolling on for 30, 25, 35 minutes. Um, I'm going to pass back to Manel for questions and uh, feel free to send them in and we'll have a crack at answering them. Great. Thanks so much, Regan. Uh, we, we've already had a couple of questions come through, so we'll just make our way through them. Uh, first and foremost, uh, you were talking about prototypes and how great it is when um, your idea becomes tangible. What are some of the costs associated with getting prototypes off the ground? 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, prototyping can be it can be less expensive, it can be more expensive. Obviously more complex products are going to be more expensive to prototype. So when you're into your you know, electronic components and things like that, probably more expensive to prototype than less. Um, there is a proliferation of 3D printers around at the moment. So anything relatively simple, you can probably get 3D printing. I know the CCIQ actually have a 3D printing lab here. So I'm pretty sure there's some sort of deal on 3D printing as well. Manel might, might fill us in a little bit about that. But um, you can get things designed. So the prototyping phase, if you like, includes design costs as well as actual prototyping costs. So um, the design process is likely to be a lot more expensive than the actual prototyping process. Once you've got the design, actually getting it made is not generally that expensive. And there are a variety of places around that you can actually get the prototype or where you can get the prototype made. You can get prototyping done in Australia or overseas. If you're looking at, at prototyping overseas, just be careful of where you get a prototype and by whom. Um, you know, there's a lot of people sending you know, samples to China and getting them prototyped over there and you can never really be sure where it goes once it gets there. So it might be a little bit safer to do that stuff at home um, rather than overseas, which will reduce cost because you're not sending stuff overseas. Even though people say China is the least expensive place on the planet to get things manufactured, it's not when it comes to prototype. Prototyping is all about the quality of the prototype. A good prototype is good. A bad prototype is just a waste of money. So you might have to spend a bit more money to get the prototype, but you gotta remember that the prototype is the thing that ultimately sells the idea. So investing a little bit more there might actually be a good idea. But um, yeah, various places around, various prices depending on complexity. Thanks so much, Regan. And uh, just to the point, CCIQ, we're working in conjunction with Brisbane City Council, um, delivering a 3D print lab for up to about seven hours worth of printing for free, I think, for businesses with an idea that they're looking to prototype as well. Um, so we might send some, through some information um, for you guys on that. Uh, the next question I have moving along, um, do you have any tips for entrepreneurs working in the not-for-profit space? Uh, any prior client experience there and any you know key differences that you've that you've found ah uh, the not-for-profit question look not-for-profits are difficult to a lot of service providers um, a lot of service providers and us included actually do um, discount services for not-for-profit so if you're a registered not-for-profit a lot of a lot of lawyers, a lot of accountants, a lot of um, patent attorneys will do um, not. I won't say cut price because it sounds tacky, but reduced charge uh, trademark registrations. I know we do that for registered not for not for profits. Um, we do a little bit of work for the RSPCA in relation to their trademarks. So there are places around that will do reduced service charge stuff for not for profits. Um, tips for not for profits: ask. That's the biggest one. Um, a lot of people are afraid to ask for reductions because they're not for profit. Um, you shouldn't be. Um, that's the definition of the of the term. You are not for profit. Um, a lot of service entities such as ours will actually say, "Are you a registered non for profit? Uh, if you are registered, then you'll get the the." the reduced charges. Um, if you're not a registered not-for-profit, then you probably won't. So getting a registration as a not-for-profit is important. Um, other types of tips, look, the issues that you face are the same as the issues that a for-profit organisation faces. So you need to take the same, same sort of tack ask the same sorts of questions. You know, not-for-profits, who is, a lot of not-for-profits that I've seen, you know, don't identify their target market segment particularly well. They just try to sell to everybody. Um, some are very good at it, um, at that sort of pigeonholing of their, of their market segment, if you like. Some are very bad at it. And you generally find the more successful ones are the ones that have identified their market segment a lot more, more in detail than the ones who haven't. Um, so same questions still need to be answered because you're up against the same the same types of issues. Um, are there are there problems that are unique to not for profits? Yes, there are. Um, money is always going to be an issue, so you want to limit what you spend. But as I said, if you ask, then a lot of people are willing to do sort of reduced price 
um, you know, free advertising in some instances for not for profits. Um, and not for profit doesn't mean you, you don't make any money. Yeah, you need to make money to make it ongoing successfully. Um, so you do need to make some money. So you need to go through those same sort of business planning exercises that we were talking about before, because it, it is a business. It, it might be a not-for-profit business, but as I said, you still have to make some money in order to pay for the stuff and it's ongoing, ongoing uh, life, if you like. Cool, I've got a couple more. Um... The, the next one we have is just talking to the point about uh, really knowing who to trust and who's working in your best interests. Uh, you know, as you said, you're entering relationships that could be 20 years in some, in some instances. Um, you know, any, any tips or suggestions on the approach there just a little further? Find someone who wears blue. That's my tip. Apparently blue is the colour of trust. So colours mean things, but yeah, I'll leave that with you. Um, to be more more serious or sensible, finding someone that you can trust is difficult. You need to find someone that's got a, a background and a performance history in the area. Um, it is important to find someone that you can work with. So personality can be important as well. Um, the trustworthy trustworthiness if you like um, a lot of professional service providers are bound by codes of conduct and all this sort of stuff and they get more investigated than than you know you'd believe the trustworthiness isn't necessarily the guide um, most professional service providers the, the vast majority of them are trustworthy it's more important that you find a service provider whose aims are aligned with yours or that can be aligned with yours. So as an example, you know, you're a small business or a large business, your service provider needs to understand that although you'd like the Rolls Royce service, what you're actually gonna be able to pay for is the Toyota service. So they need to be conscious that when they're doing work for you that you're not paying Rolls Royce prices. You know, the, the common joke with lawyers is you ring a lawyer and they charge in six, six minute increments. Yes, they do. But, you know, finding someone that you can work with might be as simple as saying, do you charge me on a, on a, a, a six minute increment basis or do you have flat fees or can you do flat fees? If I want a company set up, is that a flat fee uh, situation or do you charge me on the basis of time? So. It's about asking the questions and then trying to work out whether the person that you're asking the questions of and that is giving you the answers is actually giving you the answers because they believe those answers or whether they're the answers that they think you want to hear. So a lot of it is is touchy-feely. Um, I am always more than comfortable when people ring me and say, I'd like a first consultation and I'd like to come in and sit down with you. To me, that's gold. You know, we can do things over the internet all we like. Um, there is an upswing on people sending emails or making phone calls. It's very, well, it's not, it's not any more difficult, but I think it's better to always eyeball someone because you at least get a feeling for whether you can work with that person or not. It's very difficult to get that feeling over the, an email. You can provide information over, over email and indeed you should get all the email, uh, you should get all the information over email, but sitting down and talking to someone and being able to ask those sort of more direct questions about, you know, how do you charge me? What's your view on, um, you know, entrepreneurs taking things to market, you know, what you want is a professional service provider who is going to tell you what you need to hear and not what you want to hear. And that's, that's what professional service providers should be trying to do. If you've got, sometimes the best, the proof is in the pudding, and the best advertisement that a professional service provider can give or can or the best thing that they can do is actually say no to somebody. I want to do this, you know, I'm dead set again, I'm dead set for this, I'm gonna X, Y, Z, and the professional service advisor says, no, don't do that, that's not a good idea. Sometimes, as, as I say to my clients all the time, you pay me to tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. And you need to have a certain level of trust and understanding between the two of you before you can do that. So finding someone you can work with is hard, 
finding someone you can work with long term is even more difficult. There will be rocky patches. There'll always be the invoice that you didn't think you deserved that you got. Um, and he'll always say, yeah, I think that invoice is valid and you need to pay it. But provided there's a, a baseline understanding of what you're trying to do and, and the professional service provider or advisor actually says, yep, I understand what you're trying to do and I'm going to try and help you get there, that's what you need and that builds the trust. Thanks, Regan. And for all of you that aren't in the room today, can I just note that Regan is indeed wearing blue. I, unfortunately, am in green, so maybe a little less trustworthy on that front. Just time for one quick question, um, the last one before we run out of time. Uh, I think it's, it's a bit bigger than we have time for itself, though. Um, how do you protect your service or product um, with copyrights and trademarks? Who's the best legal rep to provide some advice on this. Before we jump into that big one, can I just say um, CCIQ have been working closely with Cullens over the last few weeks to produce a bit of a, a document which is uh, a definitive guide to IP. I use the term definitive lightly. Regan, Regan is eagerly nodding. Um, so what I might do is, is include that uh, download um, for you after this. But Regan, over to you for that very big one to, to finish us off. Oh God, IP in 20 words or less or fewer. Um, who should you trust? Me. No. Um, go and see someone. I don't care whether it's Cullens or not, but if you want advice on IP, go and see somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, IP, and we've done some webinars on IP, um, IP is one of the most jargon dominated industries around. Um, and as I've said in multiple webinars before, if you don't understand the rules, you can't play the game. So you need to understand what, what IP is suited to your particular business and there may be more than one type of IP that you can use to protect your product, service, brand, whatever. Um, copyright may protect it. Um, copyright is more for the fine arts than the industrial arts. So if you're producing product, copyright's unlikely to be of too much use to you. You probably want to be in, you know, the more the registrable forms of IP like patents or designs. Um, branding, you can use trademarks. There is some branding overlap with copyright. Um, but again, copyright's normally for the fine arts, so the, the original literary or artistic works. Um, it is a topic that is far too big for two minutes. Um, you know, people have written books on it. There's, you know, the Copyright Act is three volumes long. So it's a, it's a big area um, and the best thing you can do with it is to go and see somebody, basically lay it all out and say, this is what I'm doing. What bits of it can I protect? How do I protect it? There's a lot of this stuff available online. Um, you know, all of the, the patent attorney firms, most law firms will have an IT, an IP section um, and you can generally download a lot of information or go online and read a lot of information at IP firms. Um, so you might want to start there. A lot of them have process diagrams that sort of lay out how long it takes and you know when costs come and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, if you're really interested in, in the general stuff, you can do over the phone, but the detail as the, as how IP relates to your particular situation, you will need to talk to someone about that because it's just far too detailed and it varies far too much um, business to business, person to person as to which ones are actually used. So find an advisor, go and see them, whether it's Callens or not, up to you, but find someone, talk to them. Great, thanks so much. I think you did a good job of that that last one, which was a bit of a biggie. Um, that's all we have time for today. So on behalf of CCIQ, I'd like to thank Regan from Cullens for taking the time to present today. Regan, I know you have a special offer um, if you'd like to, to share with those still listening before we sign off for the afternoon. Oh, thanks. Um, this is just, as I said, we're designing or we're about to launch, hopefully, launch the launch pad. Um, it's, a, it's an initiative by Cullens to basically help people through this process a little bit. Um, we have designed an idea evaluator. It's basically, as I said, a, a set of questions that you go through yourself. Um, you answer the questions, each answer has a score, There's a, so you, you sum the, the individual scores for the individual questions. At the end you reach a, a, a sort of a, if it's more than this number then it's probably worth going ahead, if not 
then it's probably not. But even if you don't do it that way, the questions in the evaluator actually lead you to your weak points. So they try to identify what, what parts you're going to have problems with so that you can sort of get in front of that a little bit. Um, there you go, special rate of $15. I think we're actually, when we launch it, it's actually going to be 45 or something like that. So if you want one, feel free, jump on board. I think it's not bad. It at least gives you some sort of quantitative number and it is self-evaluated. So you evaluate your own thing. So you need to be, again, you need to be as clear as you can and uh, yeah, don't be biased. So harsh is better. Thanks. Thanks so much again, Regan. So what we'll do is send a follow-up information with these slides. A few of you had concerns that they were moving a bit too quickly. Don't worry, you'll get your own copy of these along with the presentation. Uh, we'll also include information on that special offer, which is the idea evaluator, um, and some other supporting documents like the definitive guide to IP and the Create 3D Brisbane Lab. Uh, once again, thanks Regan for your time and thank Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to having you on another CCIQ webinar in the future. Thanks so much.